very important in the end. I want to uh, on behalf of the elders and all of our church family, I want to welcome those of you who are here specifically because of the visit of the Jackson Memorial Church. Thank you again, young men and women, and Tim and the leaders of the school for this uh, fine production. Or again, in my message, you'll find how the Holy Spirit works, but it's very congruent, congruent with what I want to finally say in the moral message today. So thank you for being here. I want to make a note before I begin the talk that uh, you saw those three pictures of the Napier boys, Jordi, Ari, and now Azariah. I don't always want to be Azariah, but uh, they, you know, they look like triplets. They were all taken uh, those period pictures at infancy. But there is one missing, and that's their old older sister. And her name is Addison Jean Napier. We call her Addie, and she's going to keep those boys in line, I'm sure. <laughs> Today, uh, thank you, April, for reading the scripture for us. Today, after a couple of weeks of pausing from our study of Luke, as we um, consider both Palm Sunday and Easter, we're going to return to our study of Luke. We're going to talk about these three short stories that uh, Luke writes about in succession, the end of chapter 5 and into the first part of chapter 6. I found it very interesting to think about the fact that these were written by Luke under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, one after another, three stories in a row about Jesus' encounter with the Pharisees. I'm sure if you're uh, biblically literate at all, you, uh, you know that the Pharisees were constantly uh, after Jesus. They were trying to catch him up in false and uh, accuse him of of various things, and ultimately they succeeded, at least in their mind, uh, when they, along with the other leaders of the nation, the Sanhedrin and the chief priests, were able to convict him of what they call blasphemy, and he was hung on the cross because of this group of people who were constantly after Jesus. So these encounters have an undertone, and sometimes not much an undertone, of contentiousness about them. I want to, April just read them for you, I will refer to them, I want to kind of re, revisit each of those relatively uh, briefly, and take some things from them that we can perhaps apply to our lives today. Toward the end of the talk, I want to give you three applications for us from these three encounters. The first two of those are important, but relatively less important than the third one. You can pay attention to all of them, but the third one is the one that is the most important as we get to that. So let's review those stories. As we get to the first encounter where these Pharisees are uh, approaching Jesus, Jesus, after it appears that this happened right after uh, the time of the certain message that Jordan had preached three weeks ago on Luke 5, after calling Levi or Matthew, and then Levi threw a feast and the Pharisees complained about uh, the fact that Jesus was eating and drinking with sinners. And that's where verse 31 said, it's not the sick, healthy you need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. It's one of the reasons I asked April to read a little bit before our text this morning. The Pharisees didn't recognize themselves as one of the sinners, as one among the sinners. They thought they were the righteous. We'll get to that as we move along. In this first vignette, uh, as a follow-up to Jesus' statement, I've not come called righteous but sinners to repentance, they said to him, well, John's disciples fast and pray. And by the way, so do our disciples fast and pray. But yours go on eating and drinking. It sounds like kind of an indictment, an accusational statement. It's like saying, so what makes you so righteous? We're the ones righteous. Our people fast and pray. You're eating and drinking. Jesus answered them by saying, well, can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he's with them? Time will come when the end of the bridegroom will be taken from them 
and then gave fast. Just to mention a brief word about fasting, there's nothing wrong with fasting, and Jesus is certainly not saying that there is. But he's saying that there's a time for that, and this wasn't the time. Even in our time, there's a time for fasting. Often you can fast, if it's just to show off, it's not much. It's of no value, but if you actually fast from some meals or from some days to focus your attention on following the Lord, fasting is a very good thing and it's helpful in that regard. But after saying that, Jesus went on to tell them this parable. He said, look, no one takes a new piece of cloth and tears a pull off, tear, you know, cut something off that to patch an old piece. That would be foolish. And no one takes new wine and puts it in the old wine skins. Then he added by saying that people pretend to prefer the old wine. That may seem well curious, not a place relative to the context of the story. But in fact, Jesus is using a parable, a metaphor, to let them know that something new has come. That something new is the new covenant that was going to be initiated by him. He was in the process of doing that. They clearly didn't get it, but that's the message, and we can get it. We'll talk more about uh, this parable and this uh, instance in a moment. It doesn't say that that happened on, on Sabbath day, but the next two have events that recur, and they both are things that happen on the Sabbath. Um, by the way, before I go there, I, I neglected to mention this, so I want to go back to it. When Jesus referred to him himself as the bridegroom, we don't normally think of him as the bridegroom of Israel. Rather, he's the bridegroom of the church. And uh, here he was, calling himself the bridegroom, before they even were aware that there would be a church. So he was always acting in full mind of what he was about and what he was going to be doing. And what he was doing, what he was initiating, he was initiating something new. And we're part of what's new, even though it's over 2,000 years old. He is instituting the new covenant, which is not a matter of keeping laws, but of following him and putting one's faith in him. They don't get that. They never really did, although some of them did after Pentecost. Not of necessarily this group, but some Pharisees believed after Pentecost. But mostly they did not believe. And it says they liked the old. Change is hard for most of us. Most of us tend to like the way things are. We get into patterns and habits. And frankly, change is often not welcome. But this change is something that was absolutely essential, and it was coming, and he was giving them a preview of it, even though it was done in a parable, and they didn't understand it. The problem with the Pharisees is a problem that people today have, too. That problem is they don't know who Jesus is. They don't recognize the reality of the fact that he is, in fact, the Son of God. He is God in the flesh. They didn't get it then. And many people, of course, today don't get it. It's the big divider of humankind, what you do with Jesus. The legalism of the Pharisees, this idea of not eating with sinners, blinds them to the truth that they should have known. One of the dangers of those of us who do follow Christ and come to know him, uh, once you've been forgiven and you begin to walk with him, one of the dangers is to become pharisaical in our outlook. What I mean by that is not that we're Pharisees, but it can be easy to begin to look around and disdain other people and fail to recognize that we too are sinners who have been saved and to look down on other people and despise them. And it's, it's a dangerous thing. I'll say more about that later. Then we come to the second story. Here, Jesus is acting on the Sabbath day. His disciples, we don't know exactly where this happened, perhaps in Capernaum, which was his home base, 
probably the town of James and John and Peter and Andrew as fishermen up at the north end of the Sea of Galilee, the town of Capernaum. And uh, whether it was from there or elsewhere, we're not told in this particular section of scripture. But after, we're, after the service, the disciples were out in the road with Jesus and the Pharisees were obviously there too. And they began picking some kernels of grain and eating them on the Sabbath. And the, pa the Pharisees took issue. They asked Jesus, why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? Well, the fact of the matter is, it's not, it wasn't technically unlawful. In Deuteronomy, chapter three, verse 23 to 25, we read, if you enter your neighbor's grain field, you may pick kernels with your hands, but you not, must not put a sickle to a standing grain. That's the law of Moses. Their issue, of course, was it was doing on a Sabbath, and they, through the centuries, would have interpreted that as doing work on the Sabbath. So it was really kind of a form of hyper-legalism, and it really wasn't a reality in uh, what was happening. So when they, when they posed this question, why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath, Jesus' response was interesting as well. He referred to the time that David, King David, before he was king, while he was fleeing Saul, when he was once attacking, he went into the uh, tabernacle and grab, or the temple and grabbed bread for himself to eat the holy bread and shared it with his men. And then he makes this statement, the son of man is Lord of the Sabbath. The son of man is Lord of the Sabbath. There's two things about that that would have been very riling to these Pharisees. First of all, he called himself the Son of Man, which he often did, and you read that in the, in the Gospels throughout, the Son of Man. It's a title taken from Daniel 7, when in Jan Daniel's prophecy, he wrote this, In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like a Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power over all nations, and men of every language worshipped him. In Daniel's prophecy, in referring to the Son of Man, he's referring to the coming Messiah. He's referring to Jesus Christ. And when Jesus used this title, probably those Pharisees would have recognized that title and that prophecy, and it surely didn't make them happy. And then he added kind of salt in the wound by saying to them, the son of man is Lord of the Sabbath. Well, this would surely rankle them to be Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath was a day they honored highly. In fact, they had become legalistic over it. We're told that over the centuries, after the law was given, rabbinical leaders over the centuries added some 633 rules many of the man-made rules that they were all supposed to follow. And one of their difficulties is they became more, more interested in those man-made rules than what God was saying, and in the heart and the spirit of what God was saying, and in compassion toward others. And it hardened their hearts, and that's revealed in the third story that Luke records for us. It says, um, on another Sabbath, he went into the synagogue and was teaching. And a man was there whose right hand was shriveled. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely. Notice, they, the Holy Spirit reveals their motive. They're after him, they want to accuse him. They're looking for it. They're looking for a reason to go after him. Jesus knew what they were thinking. So he said to the man with the shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. He wanted them all to see. He knew what he was going to do. Had this man stand in front of them all. And then it says uh, this, I ask you, he said this to the Pharisees, I ask you, which is lawful on the Sabbath? To do good or to do evil? To save life or to destroy it? And then he looked at them. 
Can you imagine that look? I wonder what was in his eyes when he looked. Was he angry because they wouldn't respond? Did he have pity for their blindness and their hardness of heart? Was he frustrated? Was he saddened? We aren't told exactly what Jesus' emotions were, but I'm sure it was painful because he recognized that they didn't recognize who it was that was before them and what it was all about. They were more interested in their rules than there were in even the healing power to be used. So he healed the man right in front of them. And look at what it says about their response. Verse 11 of chapter 6. They were furious, furious, and began to discuss with one another what they might do to Jesus. What a reaction. His question revealed their hardness of heart. It revealed their lack of spiritual understanding. And it is a prelude, of course, to what would happen a couple of years down the road when they finally accused him and sent him to his death. What they didn't know, of course, is that death was ultimately in the plan of God and it affected the salvation of which we're all beneficiaries today. I want to give you three applications that we can derive from these stories. As I said at the beginning, two of them are not as important as the third, but there's still something we should be aware of. I want to talk about two of them rather minor, and then I want to focus on the third one. Here's the first one. It's legalism. Legalism. The Pharisees were hyper-legal. It was easy to see, and I've defined for you, and will again, what is legalism? Legalism is making man-made rules more important than what God says. And you begin to walk according to your rules that are beyond the scriptures, and then you condemn others for it. That's legalism. We are to be free from legalism. It's easy. It's, it's one of the things we can fall into. Our own rules and customs can become more important. We should neither add to the scriptures nor subtract from them. We need to do what God's word says. We believe that. I love what Tim said about the, the uh, loyalty of Jackson Christian School to the God's word. That's where we stand. We stand on God's word. We believe it, we believe it is God's word. We believe it's inspired God's word. We believe it's inerrant in all that it says and teaches when properly understood. Legalism is not what God does. So, what is legalism in our day? Well, it can be any number of things. I'll mention a few. Take a little risk here. I'll mention a few. Um, it's possibly legalistic on which version of the Bible you use. Well, there are a range of Bible translations. And they range from those who are translated by the ideas that are given all the way to hyper-literal translations. And there's a whole spectrum in between. And they're written over the ages. But one of the things we can rejoice in is we have copies, reliable copies, of the original documents. So there are translations of those things. It's legalistic to get hung up on a, good, on a version, especially if it's faithful to, this, to what the documents said in a variety of ways, and there will always be some small differences. But never will you find the core, the heart of the gospel, different. God has not left us in doubt about the plan of salvation. He's not left us in doubt about who he is, about who Jesus is, about the work of the Holy Spirit, about the fact that we're sinners, about the fact that we need to repent and confess and believe to be saved. There's no confusion about that. We can be legalistic about which day we meet. We can be legalistic about what things we do and don't do. Having said that, I want to make a warning on the other side. There's a, term, there's a word called antinomianism. It's probably not in your everyday vocabulary, uh, nor mine for that matter. 
but what it refers to is a belief system that says once you're saved, you can do anything. It doesn't matter. You can sin willfully. You can do any old thing because you've been saved. Well, friends, that's not the truth of the scriptures. No sincere Bible believer be would believe that or teach it. So there's two ways you can fall off the, s the bench. You can fall off being hyper-legalistic. You can also fall, fall off and try and being freedom, free from some things you shouldn't be free of. You should never feel free to sin, whatever that sin may be. Sin is not affirmed. We're to repent from sins when we find them showing up in our lives, which since none of us are perfected yet, we will from time to time. The correct response is to acknowledge it to the Lord, repent of it. That means turn from it, not affirm it, not excuse it, not say it's okay. So there's both ways to get and be wrong. You want, to, you want to stay in the center of what the scriptures teach. Don't be legalistic. The second thing we can talk about out of these three parables is what about the Sabbath? The, the Pharisees were high on this matter of what was happening on the Sabbath. Well, let's talk about that for a couple of minutes. The word Sabbath means rest. And so, you know the story of creation. God rested on the seventh day. We won't get into whether it was six 24-hour days or seven or, or not, but whatever the seventh day was, he rested. And when he gave the law of Moses on Mount Sinai, the commandment said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And the Sabbath day was in fact the seventh day. They worshiped on the seventh day, which Technically, in our view, is sundown on Friday night till sundown on Saturday night. That's the Sabbath. If you go to Jerusalem now or any uh, Jewish community that abides by that strictly, that's what their Sabbath is. And they made much of it. So the question arises, are we followers of Jesus Christ Christians in our day and age, are we supposed to keep the Sabbath? I would suggest to you that the answer to that is no, we're not. And I'll say a little more about it. First of all, as you know, we tend to worship on Sunday, which is the first day of the week. Why do we do that? Well, we do that because we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ that happened on the first day of the week. So in effect, every Sunday, we're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're not bound by the Sabbath. I'll say more about Sunday in a moment. We're not bound by the Sabbath. Jesus is our Sabbath. In what way is he our Sabbath? If Sabbath means rest, when, when and where do we find our rest? Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Our salvation is a gift. It frees us from salvation by works. There is no such thing as salvation by works. I would tell you that no one was ever saved by keeping the law. Those who were under the law and had that immense sacrificial system when they were sacrificing those hundreds, thousands, perhaps even millions of animals over the, over the centuries. They were celebrating, they were shedding blood because by the shedding of blood there's no remission of sins, but we learn in the New Testament, the shedding of that blood never really purged our sins, it just covered them. Jesus Christ died once for all, and his bloodshed purged our sins we're free of them. We're covered from them. He is our Sabbath. Having said that, let me talk a little bit about Sunday. We worship on Sunday. The New Testament tells us, don't neglect assembling yourselves together. That's what we're doing here this morning. We're assembled together to worship. And the Bible encourages that. It's not a legalistic thing. The church is the church, universal, Every true believer in Jesus Christ is a member of his church. 
but every local body of Christ who honors him and follows him is also a local church. And we're, we're told to gather together. I will tell you that we at Bethel, uh, while we're part of that church, we rejoice in other good churches all over the area who also recognize God and are under the leadership of the Holy Spirit and rely upon the scriptures and understand that you're saved by grace through faith. We're with you in that regard. So what about Sunday? Should we treat it like a Sabbath? Well, that becomes an issue that's a little more nuanced, if I may. In the New Testament, Paul says some people treat it one day above another, others treat every day alike. I would suggest to you that because we are believers, every day should be a holy day for us because we should walk with the Lord in holiness. When we sin, we should own up to it and confess it and deal with it, re regain our fellowship. And there's nothing wrong or inappropriate with setting aside time on Sunday, our worship day, to treat it holy, to treat it special. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, it might be a good practice. And if that's your practice, I commend you for it. There's also nothing that would command that. You can treat every day as a day unto the Lord. What we need to do is not condemn the one who treats it as a special day and not condemn the one who treats it as another day in which they walk with the Lord. So that's what we can learn about the Sabbath. This really brings me to the the heart of the message and the most important part, in my opinion, and it aligns with what the Royal Players talked to us about in their presentation and what Jordan talked to us about in the communion hour, and that is this. The thing that the Pharisees missed was who it was that was in front of them. They missed the identity of Jesus. Think of it. The very Son of God, God himself, was in their presence, teaching them, declaring truth, healing people, casting out do demons, doing all kinds of miracles that verified who he was. And they, of all people, should have recognized him because they had studied the scriptures. At one point, they accused him of something, and he said to them, search the scriptures, for in them they testify of me. They should have known who he was, but they didn't recognize him. They didn't identify him. Don't make that mistake. I assume that most of you here have probably already received Jesus in your own heart by faith, a metaphorical language into our hearts. You receive him by faith and you recognize who he is. And that's wonderful. And if you know him, you have a peace that passes understanding. You have assurance of eternal life. You have forgiveness of sins, all your sin, past, present, even future, Christ paid for. And you rejoice in that. If, however, you've never reached that stage of your life where you've said, yes, this is God's son, and I don't measure up, and I never will measure up. I can't earn my way there. I can't be good enough to get to heaven. I can't qualify on my own. I need Jesus Christ. And you bow the knee to him, and in faith say, Father, forgive me, because I believe Jesus paid the price for my sins. You too will be saved. And if you've not done that, I urge you to do it. It's actually the most important thing in all of life. I don't say that flippantly. It is the single most important thing in all of life, what you do with Jesus Christ. It defines your eternity. It actually defines your current life too. But I want to add this, and this is where what the players talked about, what we talk about, is something I want to emphasize to you. Most Christians, perhaps, when you, when you become a believer, you become aware of your forgiveness of sins. You become aware that you're one of God's children. But after a while, you, you, you understand, my word, this isn't the end. This is just the beginning of the journey. And as long as you walk with the Lord on this, in this life, you're on a journey with him. And his purpose is to make you more like his son. 
That's what it says in Romans 8. He sets out to work on us, to make us more like Jesus. That's what you're under. If you're following him, that's what he's doing. He's working on you. Some of those trials you go through, he's working on you. He wants you to be like Jesus. Sometimes it's not comfortable. Sometimes it's easy. But that's the process he's under. And your part is to cooperate in that process. To cooperate. And that's what they were talking about this morning in their play. There comes a point in time when you understand my word, not only am my sins forgiven, but I am blessed beyond measure. Let me read to you very quickly six blessings, spiritual blessings, that are promised to us at the end of Romans chapter 8. I'll read them quickly. Here are, excuse me, there are eight of them. Excuse me again, there are seven. My word. <laughs> here they are. I'm fallible for sure, right? Up to here. Number one, in all things, God works for our good. All things. Number two, he predestined us to become like Jesus. Number three, he predestined us, called us, justified us, which means saved us, and he will glorify us. If you've been saved, you're going to heaven. If you're genuinely saved, that's what this says. Number four, since God is for us, no one against us can ultimately succeed. Number five, nothing will ever separate us from the love of Christ. Nothing. Number six, we're more than conquerors because of Christ Jesus. Number seven, we're eternally secure in his love. When we begin to fathom and understand the depth of God's blessing and goodness to us, our response should be one of, oh my word, I trust him with everything. I trust him with myself. Paul said in Romans 12, one and two, I beseech you, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in light of all God's blessings, present your bodies a living sacrifice unto God, which is your reasonable service. It is reasonable for us who've been saved, who've been blessed, to say, God, I trust you with everything. I present myself to you. I surrender to you. So this morning, as we close our service, I'm going to add, Diane's going to come up and play a couple of verses of an old hymn called I Surrender All. And we're not going to sing it. Rather, I'd ask you, as the, I think the words will be on the screen, as she plays and as the words are on the screen, would you do this? Would you, if you've never before said, God, I surrender myself completely to you, would you do that this morning? If you've done it in the past, one of the things a preacher once said about living sacrifices is sometimes they can crawl down off the altar. If you've metaphorically crawled off the altar, have kind of slipped up, get back up on the altar this morning. Say again to the Father, Father, I, I give myself to you completely. Take me, use me, I trust you. I know you're gonna be good to me. You're not gonna do anything that will be to my hurt. It takes giving up the trash, the guilt and everything else, and trusting him, a loving father. Will you do that? Will you contemplate while Diane plays? Then I'll pray a closing prayer.
You're so good to us. Your mercies, your goodness, your kindness, your forgiveness, your generosity, your faithfulness, they abound, and they abound more and more unto us. It is only reasonable that God like that is someone who deserves our all. So Lord, I join with those here today who would say, yes, Lord, I'm yours completely. Confess my sin, I turn to you, and I praise your name. Help me to walk by the power of your spirit from this day forth. I pray in Jesus' name. God bless you all. If you want to talk or pray, you're welcome to come forward. We are dismissed. Thank you.